So I'm Tony Kelman. I've interacted with many of you on GitHub. Uh, it's good to be here on the same coast as most of the rest of the Julia team for once. So I'm talking about cross-platform installation and testing of Julia packages on Windows as pr is primarily where my expertise is. Uh, I think most people in the audience uh, can handle other platforms, but making things work uniformly everywhere I think is really important. Uh, so reasons to care about Windows support. Not many people in the room are using it, not many developers do, and I totally sympathize with that for very good reasons. But if you're in education and teaching, not, every, not all your students are going to be able to afford Macs. Uh, not everyone knows how to use Linux yet, especially if you're trying to teach an introductory numerics class. You're not wanting to teach Linux at the same time, necessarily. Uh, some industries. I was in the aerospace industry myself between undergrad and graduate school. Uh, you need to interact with proprietary software that only runs on Windows, uh, conservative IT policies. You may have instrumentation, embedded hardware, other uh, pain, painful uh, experiences that you just need to work with, and it forces you to live on Windows. Uh, or, in my case, if you are a masochist and you like fixing bugs that no one else wants to touch. <laughs> so, I have uh, good news and bad news for the package authors uh, and potentially users. So the biggest question is, does your package have binary dependencies or not? Uh, Julia has excellent C and Fortran interoperability, uh, Python interoperability as well. I'm not going to talk too much on that. But if your package code is pure Julia and you are able to do that, then you are probably almost done. Base Julia, because of a lot of work that Mike thought I was going to be talking about, uh, worked relatively well. Uh, Kano initially ported it there. Jameson and Isaiah Norton did a lot of work before I showed up. Uh, if they hadn't, if Julia was not functional on Windows at all, I wouldn't have started using it about a year and a half ago. But uh, yeah, most things should work. There's a handful of things to watch out for. Shelling out to things that don't exist on Windows, uh, differences in the file system, annoying little I.O. things. But that's pretty easy to actually test for. And what I'm trying to put out a call to arms and show you how to do, and it's not that hard, is run your tests, even on platforms you don't use, because you may have users that do. Um, and it makes their life easier if you've been able to test before they are the first person to try. So if you're wrapping a C or C++ or Fortran library, that's a hard problem. And the Python community has struggled with this for years. R sort of runs, builds the world on CRAN and has very specific requirements that make things pretty difficult. It's not a hopeless problem, though, and I'm going to talk about that in the second half. Um, there are automated tools that we've been leveraging pretty heavily for building and distributing binaries, so you don't have to do everything by hand. So talking first about testing, of whether your package is pure Julia or wrap C code, there's an excellent service called AppVair, and I want to thank Theodor Fitzner, who's the main head developer, who's been extremely responsive. If you ask him a support question, he will get back to you extremely quickly. Um, so this was one of my early endeavors is to get base Julia running with this, and it also works very well for packages. So it's free for open source projects. Uh, it's the same idea as Travis CI. When, you, when we do package.generate, we make a template Travis.yml file for you, so you just have to click one button. We don't have the template for app bear, but we could add one, and I'm going to show you what the template looks like. I just added it to example.jl yesterday, so you can see. Um, you add one file to your repository, and you click one button on AppVair's website after signing up to enable it. You log in through GitHub. Uh, so it starts up a Windows virtual machine on every commit you make to your repository and every pull request that you get. Uh, same as Travis. It installs your package, runs your tests, and reports the status back to GitHub. Tells you, does it work on this system that you've never tried before? Uh, and if you're lucky, it will. If it doesn't, you need help. And uh, at least for if I'm around and as active as I have been, you can, you're welcome to ping me and I can see what I can do. But if I haven't tried using your package before, I might not know. So yeah, as I said, example.jl now has this file. So what this is doing is really just a matrix of which different Julia versions you want to put. On Travis, for example, you can test on nightly and release Julia. This is the exact same thing, but on Windows, we also happen to make it pretty easy. You can run 32-bit Julia. On 60, on, even though the VMs are 64-bit, it's very easy to just download the installer and run it. So your package might have bugs on a 32-bit system, and nobody tries it on 32-bit Linux yet. See if it has any bugs on 32-bit Windows for 0.3, 0.4. You know, some of we may have a new, you know, a new URL for this when it's 0.4, but you can get the idea. Uh, this is PowerShell, which you may have never seen before. This is how you spell curl. Uh, it's just downloading the file. Uh, run the installer. Clone your package, 
if you know, replace your package name here, here, and here, run your tests. And Travis CI, like Travis CI, you will get a link to the log. It will show you in blue uh, whether your tests work or, or not. So getting onto the hard part of binary dependencies. What makes building scientific software on Windows hard? Like, it's hard. Uh, Windows is not POSIX. There's no POSIX shell. There's no core utils, sed, grep, awk. The, there are ports. There are POSIX compatibility layers, but they're not there by default. That's not part of the operating system. If you've ever used the Win32 API, uh, yeah, it's not fun. So al although it, is, it does probably have the best API documentation in the world, I have to give Microsoft that MSDN has amazingly comprehensive documentation. There's just reams and reams and reams of telling you all about the terrible design. Um, <laughs> so, hmm? yeah. Right, and, and that has been there forever. That has very rarely changed. Uh, and actually, well, this, package management. We all love package management. Linux kind of succeeded because the distributions let you apt get install almost everything. Uh, and that has not existed on Windows. It will, uh, some, apparently, in Windows 10. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but they're realizing it's a problem and working on it. So let's talk a little bit about compilers. Uh, Visual Studio is what kind of the platform native choice of what the people who make the operating system also make as the native platform compiler. The debugger is amazing. The IDE is amazing. Uh, but C is an afterthought in Visual Studio and has been for many, many years. Uh, C99, the standard C that you probably don't even realize you code as in when you write C, has not been supported for Microsoft until very recently, embarrassingly recently. There's no Fortran compiler in Visual Studio because Microsoft does not care about the scientific community. But as you may or may not be aware, you can't build Julia, you can't build SciPy, you can't build Octave, you can't build MATLAB without a Fortran compiler. And this, I hope, will change, but it's sort of active research to make this change. And Julia, I think, is going to play a part in this. LLVM might be playing a part in this, but we're not there yet. Uh, Intel's compilers, when, you know, I mentioned MATLAB. MATLAB uses Intel's compilers. This is the expensive option. Uh, and whether or not this is a viable choice, these compilers are not free. They are not open source. I would love if Intel donated their Fortran compiler front end to LLVM, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, we may see. They donated their OpenMP runtime, uh, and that's awesome. But so they have very high performance compilers. It has many, you know, it's a compliant C99 compiler and has been for much longer. Uh, open source compilers, Clang, very new. We like LLVM. LLVM makes Julia fast. It's sort of an amazing piece of software, uh, very permissively licensed. Uh, Windows support, they're working very hard on it. Uh, you can't really quite use it for general purpose C++ code yet, but it'll get there. Uh, also, no Fortran compiler in LLVM, which is a bummer. Uh, so GCC, GCC runs everywhere, even on Windows. Uh, in many very different variations. Uh, the particular useful one is MinGW W64, very confusingly named, but uh, it's GCC, it has GFortran. Uh, it's really kind of the only option for the scientific community with an open source compiler. And it's very good at cross compilation. Cross compiling does not have to be a black art. It, you may not have done it before, but it's actually not that hard. And it actually works surprisingly often, surprisingly well. Uh, let's talk about build systems. Auto tools, uh, configure, that assumes a POSIX shell. You need to run a configure script. How do you run a configure script if you don't have a shell? So uh, yeah, ver and make, you know, what does configure make? Configure makes a make file. Uh, CMake, not there yet. So today we build with GCC using a POSIX environment, Sigwin or msys2, cro or cross compile from Linux. And you distribute the binaries. Julia is excellent. C call support means you only need the DLLs. We don't need to make glue code on the user's machine. What Python has struggled with for so long, they need a compiler installed to wrap their glue code, or a MEX file in MATLAB, or R. We just need a DLL. We just need the library. So there are several ways to get the libraries to the user's machine. And mostly, I'm not expecting you to read this, but I'm expect hoping, hoping if you care about this, that we will put up these slides, and these will serve as examples that uh, you can use. So if your library is, not, is something small, something that you have control over or know the person who does and is not research code, potentially. You can build it yourself. And you can cross-compile. Almost all Linux distributions have cross-compilers for Windows, where you call it with this prefix, and it will be building you a Windows DLL even from Linux. 
it's kind of cool that it works, and it does. So you just upload it somewhere, and you use bin depths, uh, which is, it needs work, I'll be honest. Um, it's a pain point, and it's a hard problem, and hopefully it will get better um, as more people work on it and realize it's a problem. But you download the binary and extract the binary and install it, and your package can then use it and be cross-platform. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm out of time, but if you're, a package, if you're a library that's been around for longer, there's a chance the OpenSUSE build service already has it. And we have a package that Isaiah Norton and Jameson Nash wrote called winrpm.jl that is designed to parse and download these from the OpenSUSE cross-compiler uh, package set. Uh, and, it, and again, I'm putting this as reference. If you need to add something to it, it's actually not that hard. Really, this is just a very verbose. It's, if you've ever made a Fedora package, it's a spec file. It's really just configure, cross-compile, make, make, install, tell it what files it is. And I added this with apologies to, to Steven Johnson for switching ZMQ to this. Uh, it was an experiment, but it works. Uh, and you can add packages there. And I've done it many times. And it's, I don't know if anyone in the room who's ever added a package to Anaconda, uh, but I think it works. And I encourage people to uh, come talk to me later all about it. Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be intractable and impossible. So. <laughs>